unto us a child is born, unto us a son has been given. He came for you, he came for me, he came for the whole world, and that brings us so much hope today. Hi, I'm Amy Schaefer, and I'm here with Angela Madden. Angela, tis the season. It is. <laughs> I love it. Just last night, we went for my daughter's Christmas program, and she was Aww. this little angel. And I loved at the end, she declared, and on this day, we celebrate our Savior. <laughs> It was the sweetest just to hear their little voices, but the hope that they bring as a small child and what Jesus did for us in coming. Well, right now there are women all over the world that are shopping, they are preparing, they are setting a banquet before their families, you know, and it, it is a very crazy time of year. I personally have 23 people coming over for Christmas. Oh, and Angela, I'm responsible. I'm in charge. I mean, God help us all. God help the world. We need an intercessory prayer. No. Are you cooking for everybody? I am. You cook the whole thing. Nobody well, brings anything. They're bringing little things here and there, but yeah, let's go. This is what we do. Well, this, this is, is what your future looks like, Angela. Yeah. <laughs> I think my future is a lot of ordering and catering. Oh, great. <laughs> We've got a cooking show for you then. You know? I'm telling you, I need it. I need it. But it is. It's a busy season. And I'm excited that here at Cornerstone that we take the time to really emphasize and focus on the meaning of it all, which is Jesus. You know, in the middle of your busyness, if you're finding yourself like Amy preparing for 23 people to come <laughs> to your house, take a moment to breathe in this week his goodness and truly say, celebrate Jesus and what it means of him coming as a baby to then come and be Emmanuel with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the season for peace yes. and joy and hope and love. So I'm excited for what we have on this program today. <laughs> Me too. You know, if you like history on today's program, you can witness some of that through ancient coins of the Bible. Tom will be joined by coin historian Greg McGee, and he has some fascinating coins to share about that were actually used more than 2,000 years Years ago. And also we have B.E. Taylor coming on for Worship Wednesday singing his song Mary's Boy Child and it's coming from the archives. This is 2015 material. It's going to be great. It's going to be an incredible program but right now let's go to Sydney and her story of faith behind Trinity Jewelers. So Mark, tell us how faith is a major component of what you do here at Trinity Jewelers. Well, it comes from the name first off, Trinity, whenever I was praying about a name for the business. I have triplets, so, you know, when you look up Trinity in the dictionary, it says group of three. Things seem to come in threes in my life anyway. But again, I wanted the Holy Trinity to be represented. I wanted to be right up front who we were. And it just it just came to me. It was just amazing. I just all of a sudden was like, Trinity, what other name would you name it? You know? So that's how we came up with the name. And from there, we've just tried to start from the very beginning to build and reflect God in all that we do. For more than 50 years, Trinity Jewelers has been serving the greater Pittsburgh area and beyond by offering custom and fashion jewelry for both men and women. Located in a historic schoolhouse building in the North Hills, the Christian-owned family business says it loves to celebrate life's closest relationships. I had a chance to sit down with the owner, Mark Helgerman, to hear how this business also operates like a ministry. So Mark, tell us about Trinity Jewelers and the faith component that is attached to this business. Yes, yeah, so, you know, I didn't become a Christian until I was 28 years old, so actually the beginning part of my jewelry business, I was not a Christian, and once I came to faith, I wanted to be able to offer the opportunity to other Christians and all to have a place they feel comfortable coming to, but I also wanted to be a chance to be a ministry as well. So that's one of the reasons I named it Trinity was I wanted to represent my faith. I mean, I've put God 
first in this business. I mean, it, I'm no business whiz or anything like that. I give all the credit to God, the growth that he's given us. I mean, it, we've just grown every year since we opened. And I feel like it's because, you know, I put him first in this business. And as it's grown, I, you know, and as my maturity as a Christian grew too, I could see more and more of what Trinity can be and do. And we love to play Christian music on, on our background music here. We have a actually part of the original chalkboard from the one room schoolhouse that we keep that we do a calendar each month on just for the fun of it but we also put scripture on there as well so it's nice because it opens up those opportunities to communicate with people and and you know we never want to hide from our faith you know we want people to know who we are you know so it, it's a blessing was there even like a story like um that stands out or a testimony of just you saw god's hand at work with somebody purchasing jewelry <laughs> It doesn't take much to look at every story. I mean, I'm trying to think of an individual one that I could really point out, but it's the it's the look on their faces. It's it's the joy in their hearts that they get out of creating that custom ring that really is special and special for us. I mean, I'm blessed to be in this business. I mean, the jewelry business is a wonderful thing because you're dealing with people in the most important moments of their life. Certainly, we have some sad times too, you know, with other things, but all in all, you're dealing with that and it, it brings joy. I mean, I love coming to work each day and I'm blessed with an amazing staff who reflect God and, and we're, I think we're very unusual in that we're, we're such a family here. You you know, I mean, and not the kind of family that even fights. I mean, we just, everybody gets along so well. And, you know, I think it's because we put God first. One thing that here at Trinity Jewelers that you want everyone to know that they can afford the jewelry. So you have different price points as part of what you do. Because, I mean, I, I don't want to sound cliche by any means, but because we manufacture, I mean, and because I want to be fair to everybody, doing custom isn't isn't like this huge upcharge. It isn't two, three times the cost. It's what we do. We make jewelry you know so we don't have to charge you know a lot of jewelry stores have to rely on third parties to make that happen and everything and certainly there'll be an upcharge for that but you know we actually create it so it's it's very affordable so it should never ever scare anybody from that standpoint if they want a custom piece of jewelry they can rest assured that it's very affordable and something they can Mark, how has God grown your faith, you know, through your business over the years? It's in the little things honestly like you know, a lot of people have a big story to say, but it's how he's been so faithful. I mean, even even through recessions like 2008, we continued to grow. You know, even through COVID, he's just always there. I mean, it's everything just works. You know, and it and it's never that I see it up front or I'm, I'm asking for. It. Well, I'm obviously always praying for the business, but it's always for me in the rearview mirror. I look back and I go, wow. I see how he works and you don't even know it's happening. It's, it's incredible. I want people to have joy, you know, in, in a world where it seems like a lot of people are hurting and stuff. I mean, it, it's in the special moments of life. I want people to cap, you know, certainly in the jewelry business, we're capturing those, but I want people to feel that every day, feel God's presence every day and feel him at work because Satan always wants to take that joy away from you. And, I, you know, my heart is that I want them to re live within God's will for their lives. and truly feel the joy that we should have each day. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. This is a coin from Bible times. We're going to be talking right now to Greg McGee, ancient coins of the Bible. Greg, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me. So tell me, how did you get in? I'm fascinated. I love history. I'm fascinated by these biblical coins. We're going to see some in just a minute. But tell me how you got into this. Well, it's a family thing. My father collected, my grandfather collected. And uh, about 20 years ago, I was at a coin show and I had a whole bunch of stuff to sell to a dealer. And he said, I'm going to need 30 minutes. So it gave me 30 minutes to kill. And I went to an ancient coin dealer. At that time, there weren't that many of them. Uh, the guy barely spoke English, and I asked him if he had any coins from the Bible, and he, he didn't understand me. <laughs> so somebody interpreted for him and said Judea, and he showed me a widow's mite. And at the time, it was like 20 or 40 bucks. It was really inexpensive, but it was crude. You couldn't tell much different from that coin in Iraq. <laughs> okay. So that kind of got me started, just the fact that these coins still exist. Uh, flash forward about 20 years. Uh, I'd worked as a stockbroker for the better part of my career, uh, but around 44 years of age, uh, I loved the job. It almost killed me. I had a heart attack and wow. I had a quintuple bypass surgery, and uh, it just got to be uh, so demanding that the stress wasn't uh, 
I wasn't able to continue working. Uh, I tried to come back from the surgery and I had more complications. So uh, the company that I was working for at the time told me, we don't think you could do this job and stay alive. So they gave me a, a buyout package and paid my health care. And uh, it gave me a couple of years to think. And God's been calling me since I was a child. And uh, this particular time, he gave me a vision. It sent me back to that crude widow's mite. I ended up meeting uh, a couple of guys in Dormont. It's called cybercoins.net. Brad and Blaine Schiff run it. And I walked in and I asked them if they had any ancient coins. And they said they did. We struck up a friendship. I bought a few. And I asked them, I said, why don't you let me sell all these ancient coins that don't have anything to do with the Bible and buy coins that tell the story of the Bible? And that was about two years ago. And uh, what you have in your lap is the fruit of my labor. Well, I love what I'm, I'm holding here. Why don't you tell us, I mean, this is a very important coin. This is a widow's mite. Is that where we want to go first? Or Absolutely. Let's, Absolutely. Let's go there. That story is told two times in the Bible. It's the greatest story of sacrificial giving ever told. Uh, Jesus was at the temple and he saw people throwing gold and silver in and he paid them no mind. And a widow came and she threw in two small copper coins and he noticed and he said, truly, she has given more than the others. The two small copper coins that she threw in would have bought her bread for the day. So she may have gone without eating. Her heart was so right, she gave all that she had. And we're still talking about her 2000 years later. That coin that's in your hand is the type of coin that circulated when Jesus walked the earth and the disciples walked the earth. Do you have a picture of this? Is there something that I we do? This is a, uh, oh, let me see if I can go to the slides. Yeah, because it's amazing what is on here. And you've told me the story that I think is, is, is incredible that, that there was a, 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 there a Hebrew ruler and there we have, we have the coin. There's the widow's mite. Why don't you tell us what's on there and what the story is? It's a great story. And the more I've become obedient in this vision that God gave me for this ancient coin ministry, the more he's opened up my eyes. There are so many historical elements to this coin. Alexander Janius was a Hebrew king about 100 years before Christ was born. He thought he was the Messiah. So much so that the widow's mite coin he created because he thought he was a fulfillment of two verses. In Numbers 24, it says a star will come out of Jacob. He put the star. Okay, so we have, we have, he put a star on there. Uh, I think we have, uh, well, we're, we're gonna get that picture in a second. But tell us the story, he put the star. He put the star in the back of it because he thought he was the star that would come out of Jacob. It was clearly a messianic prophecy about the Messiah. Um, he also thought that he was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies that the Messiah would be king and high priest. That was clearly the only office that the Messiah could fulfill. There was always a king. King David had a high priest. Yeah. He never claimed to be both. Alexander Janius thought he was both. Uh, he this basically, was about 100 years before Jesus. 100 years before Christ was born, this coin circulated basically is a, an advertisement. Before mass media, coins were the information source of the day. If you wanted to know who was in power, you looked at your pocket change. If you wanted to know what gods were worshiped, you looked at your pocket change. For 100 years before Christ came, this coin had six or seven different messianic messages on it. Uh, the star that would come out of Jacob obviously is on the back. There's Paleo Hebrew in the back. The front of it has Greek lettering. And the Old Testament is Jesus Christ concealed in Hebrew prophecy. The New Testament is Jesus Christ revealed in Greek. So the back of the coin has Hebrew. The front of the coin has Greek. And this is all on the widow's mite. We just think of it as a penny. Yeah, and then... yeah. the more I searched into it, the deeper I found. And uh, God used that proud king, Alexander Janius, uh, to accomplish his purposes. For 100 years, that circulated in people's pocket and it told the story of the Messiah to come. Yeah, well, let me get, I'm gonna get another one out of here. I think this is the one that I, I'm, I'm, tell me about, about this coin. In fact, you said I could hold that one. Absolutely. <laughs> this is a silver shekel of tire. 
It was the only coin the Pharisees would accept as payment of the temple tax. And it has a couple of implications. If that was the only coin they accepted as payment of the temple tax, that would have been the coin that they gave to Judas to bribe Judas to betray Christ. Okay. A uh, couple of other things. There was a story with Peter. They were always trying to get Peter and Christ in trouble using taxes because that would be a death sentence if they said something wrong about taxes. Uh, the Pharisees came to uh, Peter and they said, does your master pay the temple tax? And he said, of course he did. You know, Peter was really good at giving an answer that he thought was right without asking if it was right. <laughs> so uh, according to the Bible, he went back and met Jesus in a house and Jesus uh, knew what he did and he said, Peter, who pays taxes? Do the king's children pay taxes or do the king's subjects? And Peter must have got real interested in his shoes at the time. Uh, looking down, he says, how does Christ know that I, I said the wrong thing? And Peter said, well, clearly the king's children don't pay taxes. And Christ, knowing that he was the son of God, he didn't proclaim it and beat his chest. He demonstrated that he was the son of God with a miracle. He said, Peter, mm -hmm. so we don't cause offense. Go to the lake, throw out a line. The first fish you catch will have a four drachma coin in its mouth. The temple tax uh, was half a drachma. He said, that coin will pay your temple tax and mine. So he demonstrated his divinity with the miracle. He told Peter in words, he says, I'm the son of God. I don't pay tax to the, the temple. It's, it's amazing to hold a, a coin that's that old. That's the know most that, beautiful that, example that, I've ever seen. It's, yeah, uh, I'm gonna hand that back to you so that you can put that back in its protective case. But uh, when you see these coins and when you, I mean, uh, from the historical perspective, it's tremendous. But what does it say to you about the Word of God? Those coins in your hand are physical evidence that the Bible is a historically accurate document. So if you take a widow's bite, you can Google it and you can find all the history that I told you about Alexander Janius on the internet all by itself. There is a nine coin template that I have that we share with collectors to help them organize things. And it tells the story of the New Testament from the book of Matthew all the way to Acts. It has Pontius Pilate's coins. It's got the silver shekel of Tyre, the 30 pieces of silver, uh, the render unto Caesar coin. Uh, all of those stories are based in fact in the historical figures behind them left the trail behind and those coins are the physical evidence of their existence. Do you have, uh, do you have any other pictures or do you have a picture of this particular one? Yeah, this, that is the render unto this Caesar is the render coin. render unto Caesar coin, which just, uh, again, it's got Caesar's inscription uh, and his likeness on the front. On the back, it looks like a, a a false god on there or something. It is. That was a Caesar's uh, wife. It was Livia, and she appeared as a, uh, a form of a god. Okay. So, again, they were always trying to trick Jesus and the disciples into saying something bad about taxes uh, because that could eliminate the problem. The Romans would come in and take care of the problem from there. Jesus was tactful in the same way that he demonstrated his divinity with Peter by performing the miracle. They and Mark asked him, uh, Master, is it lawful to pay the Roman tax? And Jesus said, show me the coin for the tax. The coin that you see there is the emperor who was in power when Christ walked the earth, Tiberius Caesar. They showed him that coin. And he said, whose image and, and inscription are on it? And he said, Caesar's. And that comes the quote that most people will remember, render unto Caesar what is Caesar. But the most important part of that verse was render unto God what is God's. That coin was made in Caesar's image. We were made in God's That's image. Right. So there was a powerful story in there that often gets overlooked. More than the uh, tax question, Jesus said, give yourself to God. You're made in his image. Render unto God. That's right. I'm, I'm going to put this back in here with all these other amazing coins. Uh, Greg McGee. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. It encourages me and thrills me uh, as someone who studied history to uh, see these, but also like you said, it verifies the biblical record. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much. You're very welcome.
If you are in Pittsburgh and you love Christmas, B.E. Taylor was a huge part of our tradition here, not only in the city of Pittsburgh, but also here at Cornerstone Television, a dear friend and one of our favorite men at Christmas time. Now this song that he's going to sing today is from circa 2015. Let's go to B.E. Taylor now with Mary's boy child. Long time ago in Bethlehem, Holy Bible say, Mary's boy child Jesus Christ was born on Christmas Day. Hark now, hear the angels sing, newborn king today, man shall live forevermore because of Christmas Day. While shepherds watch their flocks by night See a bright shining star Hear a rock choir singing Music come from afar Joseph and his wife Mary Came to Bethlehem that night Find a place to bear a child not a single place was inside, they sing. Hark now, hear the angels sing. Newborn king today. Man shall live forevermore. Because of Christmas Day. Trumpets sound, the angels sing. Listen to what they say. Because of Christmas Day, Christmas Day. What do you want to say, B. Taylor? I want to say Merry, Merry, Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Here we go. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas, yeah. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Yeah, I want to say to you, Merry Christmas, everyone. Woo! Merry Christmas, yeah. What a beautiful song. Merry Christmas indeed. A Savior is born, Emmanuel with us. And what I loved about today's program, Amy, is that when we see Trinity Jewelers or we see Greg McGee, he's not coming to us from a church pulpit. He's not coming to us, you know, in the middle of a synagogue, but right where they are, right in the marketplace. And I believe that's really the call of Emmanuel, the God who came to live with us, that today in this season in particular, that we can show up right where we are in our jobs, in our careers, on the ball fields, as the representative of the God who is with us. Mm. Isn't that good news? Yes. And you know, this morning I was reading through my Christmas Advent devotional and the story was about Esther. And I was like, how intriguing, because it's one of my favorite stories of all time, combining it with Christmas. Mm. And he said, what Esther had to do was put away her, her poverty, or her, she wasn't good enough to be the queen and she had to get dressed in royal clothes. She had to put on the royal perfumes in order for the king to accept her. Yes. But our king, he laid aside the royalty and the robes and the glory and the honor and he came to earth yes. to relate with us. <laughs> 
Angela Emmanuel, God with us so that we in turn could be sons and daughters of the King. Yes, truly. And I'm reminded of that scripture just as Greg was talking about, render to Caesar what is Caesar, render to God what is God's. And we are his vessel. As Amy just said, he has garnished us. He has put on us his garments, his beauty. And in that space, what is it we can give back to him? How can we show mm -hmm. up in this season for our loved ones? We're all going to be with those 23 folks on Christmas. Yes. <laughs> How can we show up as the light and the royalty of Jesus? That is a question of the <laughs> life of our lifetime. We show up in love. We yes. show up with peace. We show up with joy, just yes. like Jesus does in our life. And remember the, the second part of that scripture, for unto us a son is born, yes. unto us a child has been given. Mm -hmm. And the government shall mm -hmm. be upon his shoulders. Talking about marketplace yes. and these ancient biblical coins yes. and what we're doing in our everyday coming and going. We're occupying here until he comes. It's our job, Angela, to bring heaven to earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when we're at Marshall's, when we're at the stores, when we're, we're at the giant eagle and you just waited 30 minutes to get checked out and to get help. What ought to come out of us, yes. right? Is, is that spirit of life in yes. Christ Jesus. Yes, you know, I've heard it said before, it's strange if we went to an orange tree and we plucked that orange and the pressure came and when that fruit was squeezed, it apple juice came out, we would all say, this is appalling, what is this, you know? But in these seasons of busyness, when we get squeezed, it ought to look like Jesus coming out. So today, one of the pieces of encouragement I have for you is are you feeling the pressure and the squeeze of this season or of life? And when you look around as you're being squeezed, what's coming out? Is it the fruit of the Spirit? Is it goodness? Is it kindness? Is it gentleness? Is it self-control, love, and joy? If not, turn your gaze back to Jesus. Even in that moment when you want to freak out, turn your gaze back to Jesus and let the one who is love, who is peace, who is joy, fill your heart. So if he is Emmanuel, God with us, then he is in us. Yes. He is for us and he will enable us this season to be Christ to a lost and dying, hurting world. So don't give up hope because you can do it because he's in you. Yes, he is in you, he is for you, and he wants to replenish you in this season. May this Christmas season truly be remarkable and special in new ways, that the Son of God came into you and is for you, even in this moment. <laughs>